Welcome to Hello Darling. We are at the magnificent showroom of Ferguson Alfresco Lifestyle with the unique selection of outdoor custom-made cooking equipment. The perfect setting to introduce my very special guest for today, Rob Broadfield, WA most respected and feared food writer and critic. But there is much more to Rob Broadfield life and career, which has spent media, business, corporate advisory, politics, writing, journalists, restaurants, reviewing, and government advisor, as we will uncover today. Welcome, Rob. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Rob, thank you for preparing a surprise dish for our Hello, darling viewers today. When did you discover your love for food? I think probably I was about seven or eight years old and I started cooking cakes for my mother because um, she loved cakes and I loved cooking and it sort of grew from that and then I found out even at that young age I had a bit of an aptitude for it and I enjoyed it. It's as simple as that. So um, it grew from there. When did you do the first restaurant review as a professional food critic? That would have been, golly, 1995 maybe, so a good 20 odd years ago. Um, and that was on a freelance basis. I was in business at that time, so I wasn't even in the journalism world. Um, but, uh, you know, I loved journalism, of course, and I was brought up in journalism and trained as a journalist and worked as a journalist and got out of it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that was really just as a freelance thing because as a hobby more than anything for business news. Do you know that newspaper of in course. Perth? Um, and they rather courageously published my restaurant reviews um, because they didn't have huge lawyers uh, in their organisation that we do at the West, who legal everything I write now. Yeah. Um, so they courageously published it and it, got a, it was a real hit. So that was the beginning of you being a food critic? Yeah, correct. That's how it happened? That's how it happened. Amazing. Do you remember the meal that you reviewed? Well, uh, maybe it's a silly question. I can't, but I remember some mad Italian phoned me up and promised to kill me. So it wasn't a great review. Okay. <laughs> that brings me to a question about your dream job. Yeah. You have the power. You can make it or break people. So they say. Any, any downside to this dream job apart from food commerce? Well, I think the downside is if you, if you have a thin skin, which you can't in this business, um, you simply can't, otherwise you wouldn't survive, then the downside is there are people who dislike you enormously for what you write. Mm. Comes with the trade. Um, there are some who take that even further and they get quite vitriolic about it. But the upside is even better because the upside is about helping an industry in Perth which is still very much in its early days compared to say Melbourne and Sydney or Paris or wherever really? and to give great chefs a leg up and promote them and get their businesses going and I have the power to do that which is fabulous mm -hmm. um, I don't wield that power lightly but I can do great things for good people if I so choose and I really like that part of the job enormously. Beautiful so a lot of happy grateful people out there a lot of yeah, and they, but I don't do it undeservedly. I mean, they deserve it. It's, and they would probably get there anyway. It's just that I have the capacity to maybe accelerate that growth for them a little bit mm -hmm. by giving them a very public realm. Mm -hmm. So you obviously not always book in a restaurant under your name? Never under my own name. Tell me one of the most unusual, funnest names you booked under except Hello Darling today. Uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> okay. I'm not kidding, it was Mrs. Doubtfire. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever wear a disguise not to be recognised? Look, the, um, the guys at Channel 7 have threatened, the makeup guys at Channel 7 have threatened to do me up as Mrs. Doubtfire. There was one restaurant owner who publicly uh, banned me from his restaurants, before I'd even reviewed any of his restaurants. And he publicly banned me and went out in the press and said that. And I thought, great, I'm so going to get you, buddy. So, I, so the girls at 7 said, I'll tell you what, we'll dress you up as a woman. Yes. Um, the trouble is, I just look like an ageing lesbian dressed up as Mrs Doubtfire. It'd look okay. awful, wouldn't Nothing it? Nothing wrong with <laughs> that. Just look awful. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we, we nixed that idea, but one day, Barbara, one day I will. I will look around. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, give me a hint. Who knows? I might go as Barbara McNaught. Very easy disguise. That's right. Blonde bob, red lipstick and a big smile. Exactly. Your best food experience you ever had? So, it's, it's interesting, and I think you'd probably agree with this, it's not about posh. Mm -hmm. um, some of the best experiences I've ever had have been about where you are at the time and who you're with. Um, there's a couple of them. When I was in France as a youngster, there was a, um, I met this bloke called Negocion. Now, they're the guys that wander around all the different wine mm -hmm. estates, and they've got like milk crates, and they mm -hmm. pick up samples of wine from each estate. The Negocion then takes those away and makes decisions about blending and so on on behalf mm -hmm. of the, the estates, the domains. 
Anyway, through a mate of a mate, I met this bloke, and he was a lovely bloke, but my age, but he was so conservative. He had a suit and a tie and all this mm. sort of stuff. And I had a backpack. And anyway, we made firm friendship, we had a few wines, and he said, come home to my place, my mother will cook you dinner. Mm -hmm. What she cooked was simply extraordinary. They used the prunings off the vine leaves, off the vines, mm -hmm. um, to create a fire in the hearth. She put a grate over the hearth, toasted some beautiful French bread, just above the coals, wow. spread it with a seeded mustard she'd made herself. Then, and this is the coup de grace, mm. roasted bone marrow on the fire. You know how it goes all gooey and sticky yeah. and fatty? Scraped out the bone marrow and smeared it on the bread. And we had that with a glass of wine and a salad. Amazing. Best meal ever. I don't think any of people's best memories are in five star places. I think it's usually about family or circumstance. Darling, going back from the youngest News executive in 1986, That's am I right. correct? Yeah, I was, I was in charge of a network at, at 24 years of age, so yeah. Wow. Yeah. To the ministerial advisor under yeah. Howard government 20 years later. Correct. Tell us the highlights about your journey. I can't say, yeah. tell me all the journey, I love to. Well, the interesting thing about politics, that came at a time in my life, uh, the, my business life was going well. I owned a couple of radio stations, uh, a very large PR firm and a few other interests and so on. A friend of mine who was a senator in the federal parliament, a very good mate, a guy I'd met through yachting, uh, he said, what are you doing? Well, actually, I'll back up a little bit. Yeah. I was taking a bit of time off, and my, my wife, who's a very hard worker and a good worker, and she's mm -hmm. a senior executive in an oil and gas company, she rang me one day, as couples do, what did you do today, darling? And I went, oh, I played tennis with the girls. <laughs> there was this icy silence on the end of the phone. She said, get a job. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so... My mate who was a senator in the uh, Howard government rang me and he said, look, um, I believe you're looking for something to do. I went, yeah, he said, well, I'd love you to come and join us because this is, we're at the pointy end of government here. Um, anyway, long story short, I took that job as a kind of a sabbatical for me. And what was the official position of... Senior advisor to Senator Ian Campbell, who was mm -hmm. the Minister for the Environment then. So we did a lot of interesting stuff um, in the Antarctic, uh, with preservation of um, natural wetlands in Australia, mm -hmm. a whole raft of really interesting projects we did, mm -hmm. which had strong political elements to them. We had to battle state governments and some of these things and so on. So it was very invigorating stuff. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, like most Australians, I had a very jaundiced view of politics. Well, more to the point, politicians. But after that experience, that two years in that job, I came away with an enormous regard for them. Um, I think they work very hard. Mm -hmm. People say they don't, mm -hmm. but politicians, from my observation, do. It's a seven-day-a-week job, mm -hmm. calls at three in the morning from the Prime Minister's office, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. They never stop. That's right. Uh, you once referred to it, high adrenaline, two years of the high adrenaline pumping, yes? Yeah. Holocaust experience. Exactly. Yes? And, and it's exacerbated by living in Perth. I mean, I was on sometimes five to six flights a week. I'd fly from Perth to Cairns to do a press conference, then I'd fly from Cairns to Canberra to to chair a quick little meeting, then it would be Canberra to Sydney to mm. do some select committee, and then mm. it would be Sydney to Melbourne for an overnight fundraiser for the Liberal Party, and then back mm. to Perth for the weekend. That was, that was two years of that, you know. So you don't have to be good chef to go into federal politics? <laughs> <laughs> no, that didn't even help. <laughs> didn't even help, no, huh? no. How was the food there anyway? Dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, may I ask you, you basically have so many talents, you men of so many directions and, and, and your journey is pretty incredible. Amongst your many talents, you are a published author. Correct. A, a, a small one. I mean, the, the Good Food Guide is what you're referring to. I would love to hear about it. Yeah, well, so the, the West Australian, in its, in its wisdom, I went to them with a pitch uh, in 2010 that we should have a good food guide in Western Australia, just like the Age Good Food Guide in Melbourne and the Sydney Morning mm -hmm. Good Food Guide in Sydney. Very, very polished books. Um, take a lot of work to get them done because it's, you've got to re review 300 restaurants. Mm. Uh, I employed 20 reviewers to do that, so it costs mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Anyway, g God bless them. In their wisdom, they decided they'd make a run at it and um, very successful. And it's going now for six years, yes? So the first one was 2011, so yeah, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, great, six years. Fantastic. You're good at maths. Great. Mass. Rob, you experienced cancer. Mm -hmm. You were given 10 years, 10 days to live after two years of misdiagnosis. Correct. Please tell us, 
tell our viewers about this experience, what went through your mind? Well, sort of, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I hope. But also ludicrous. I mean, I, as you say, two years of misdiagnosis, you know, the, oh, you're going to, I was, I was sleepy. You know, cancer just eats away your body, so yeah. it makes you very sleepy. So I go to the GP and say, look, I'm really sleepy and I've got pains here. And he go, oh, you're depressed with these drugs. So, you know, this went on for a while and then they did tests. I thought it was my heart because my heart was hurting and all this. Anyway, they just got it wrong. By the time they found it, the oncologist said to me, mate, you've got about 10 days here. Sort your life out. The great story was, he said, look, chances are you're not going to make it. Why don't we just chuck as much chemo at you as we can? So if it doesn't get you, we'll probably kill you with that anyway, but let's give it a crack. And they did, and I was very fortunate. My body or my predisposition uh, or my physiology was immediately responsive to it. Immediately responsive. It took me a good year and a half to recover. I was dreadfully ill. I went down to a gorgeous 67 kilograms. There's a plus. That was a highlight, um, yeah. But, um, but my body was imme immediately responsive to it, and um, it took a good year and a half until all the tumours are gone, but I had 250 tumours in me. Gee. And they all disappeared after two years, it was amazing. But do you remember the moment, I'm sorry, it must have been horrible, when you were told 10 days? Do you know, Barbara? Honestly. Yeah, honestly. You're kind of numb at that point. You don't actually think it through. It's like, oh, you, and I just became very scientific about it. I said, mm. oh, that's interesting. So what does that mean? You know, you ask dumb questions mm. because it's a bit of a shock. Not a shock that makes you turn into a blubbering mess. I was actually very distant from it in a funny way. You just accept it. You ask stupid questions and, um, and then slowly you get used to the idea. That's right. And uh, what I was going to say, how does this experience change your life? I'm not asking if, I already assume, or did this experience change your life? Yeah, Maybe no. I rephrase myself. Yeah, it did. Um, not in any profound way though, because Maybe I'm just too shallow. No, I'm only, <laughs> only kidding. But Six kids, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting question. People say, how did it change your life? You know, and they expect you to go and sit on a mountain and sing Kumbaya. Mm. That's not what I was going to do. Mm. But it did, definitely did change it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more grateful now than I ever have been before about everything around me, mm. about what I own, what I have. Mm. Very grateful for all that, which whereas probably before I was a bit of a tosser, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is definitely maybe... A much more thoughtful person about that sort of stuff. Mm. What I didn't want it to do though was modify me because a lot of my mates said to me, oh here's your opportunity mate, you know you can give up your disparate lifestyle, you know you're drinking and you're eating and you Slow no, down. No way, mm. no way. I, I'd, I'd, what's that old saying, I'd rather die at 65 standing up than at 75 on my knees. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was always my way, so I just continued in the same path. In your biography you referred that you found a humour in such a dark days of this experience, journey with cancer. How did you find humour in this time? Oh, just the idiocy of some of the, some of the people who, you know, really good, good well-meaning mates who'd come and see me in hospital. And, you know, I was desperately ill and they'd, they'd come in and some of them were really uncomfortable. Um, some were sort of cracking jokes, which made my eyes water, they were so bad. Um, some fainted, like they used to get, get the chemo in, yeah. but they had these things called cannulas, and they're about that long. And they stick, and they're big, fat things, and they stick them up here into your arm. And mm. a mate of mine, who's a country boy, you know, he crutches sheep and stuff, you know, he's no, no wimp. And he's sitting in the corner, and the nurse came and she said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I just have to give Mr. Broadfield his thing. Yes. And he's going, and he just fainted, he swooned and then <laughs> fell off the chair. Oh you know, so there were some very amusing sort of anecdotes. During Incredible. That time. Rob, you are so strong and so positive. I'm sure that was a huge factor that helped you to come out of it. It's interesting you say that. A lot of people do say that. Do you know, people say, you know, good fight, mate, you fought cancer. It's mm -hmm. absolute bollocks. Oh, okay. Yeah, because cancer doesn't know a tough personality. You know, you either die by it or you don't. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people say, you've got to fight it, mate, you've got to be strong. Cancer doesn't know strength. Okay. It just knows whether it's going to kill you or not. Mm -hmm. And luckily I was the one that wasn't killed. Do you think today the love for food, the knowledge of food, the celebration of food, the programs, the, as I say, festival, mm. ongoing mm. festival, good food, can it change people, people's lives? So it can in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. um, 
particularly amongst young women, the young women that I work with, say in their late 20s, early 30s, there's a generation of young women that have never cooked. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how to cook. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the TV shows like MasterChef and all those sort of shows have brought that generation of, and I specifically say young women because men are dorks at cooking anyway, so they don't really count, um, brings a, a, a generation of young women back to the kitchen and they're loving it. I mean, mm -hmm. these people I work with in TV and newspaper, you know, they're smart, well-educated women, Great. Um, uncompromisingly mm. good at what they do, put them in a kitchen and they now they're loving it. They have dinner parties. More, that generation lost out on dinner parties. Yes. My generation did them. Yes. And now they're doing a lot of that stuff at home and really enjoying it. So they're finding their mojo in the kitchen. Fantastic. That's a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. The other one, I think, is the democratisation of food in the sense that people, because of these TV shows and all the stuff that's written about food these days, people are better customers in restaurants. Mm -hmm. They understand more. Now, it can, in some senses, make them a little more domineering in a restaurant, mm -hmm. a little more smart alecky. That's mm -hmm. the downside. But the, the upside far outweighs it, and that is that people much more understanding of what they should expect in a restaurant, their behaviours, what can be done in a restaurant, what foods they like, how they like it prepared and that sort yes, of thing. That's right. That's which right. makes it better for everybody. Tougher for the chefs, but better altogether. Yeah, but in a, yes, you're right, but in a peculiar way better for the chefs because chefs like informed customers. Do you know, you, a chef will work harder for someone who knows what they're talking about. It's mm. that simple. Absolutely. Being so prominent, you rubbing shoulders, with so many celebrities, any special stories, most you know, unforgettable experience. Tell us, tell the viewers. <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of stories, of course, which we couldn't we couldn't say. Oh, please um, come on, give us a hint. Well, I will give you a hint. Okay. Um, and it's not so much celebrities, but I was once flying in uh, in Air Force One, the um, Prime Minister's aircraft, which we call Air Force One. It wasn't really. Mm. It's a Boeing seven three seven kitted out as a private VIP yeah. jet. And it was just, there was me and a, another couple of guys on it flying to Perth. And uh, I had to go to the loo and he said, I'll just go to the Prime Minister's loo. And I went, yeah, all right. All right. And um, go in there and it's fantastic marble floors and, you know, it's, even the loo's got a window and everything yeah. like that. It's fantastic. So I get out and he said, what did you think? And I went, oh, it's great. And I opened a few cabinets while I was sitting on the throne and inside one of these sort of walled up veneered cabinets was a, a, a wash bag mm -hmm. and a little tag off the end of it and it said, the Honourable J. Howard. Mm -hmm. So I opened the wash bag, what's, <laughs> what's he got in there? Open it, put it back, thought, great. I went out there and I told my mate in the plane, he said, well, why didn't you nick it? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Rob, may I ask you, when do you think you feel happiest? What's happiness for you? Look, happiness is pretty easy for me to achieve, <laughs> frankly. Yes. There's a, a lot of times when I'm happy. Love cooking for friends more than anything. It's a great delight. Mm -hmm. um, I often do this at our beach house where I'll just get on the spur of the moment, I'll ring up 20 mates, come around for dinner. Mm -hmm. So I'll have, you know, 10 odd couples around there and it just turns into a, a bacchanal of booze and great food and lots of good stories. I love yachting. Um, very much. Uh, I've got a yacht down at Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club, which we race regularly. That is my happy place. Mm -hmm. um, and anything propped up at a bar, basically. Mm -hmm. Nothing. The finest place in the world. If you want good counsel in your life, you need some psychological help. Sitting on a bar stool is the best place to be, I reckon. No need to go to a shrink. Talk to a barman. Great. Men of so many talents, so many successful careers and obviously still going so, so strong. What would be your advice to people out there that are searching for their calling? Look, it's as cliche as all get out and I'm almost ashamed to say it's so cliche, but you just got to follow your heart. I'm very fortunate in my life in terms mm. of you know, doing well, but it was never about the money. Mm -hmm. It was always about the love. Mm -hmm. You get that bit right, money will just flow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And Rob, what can you tell us about future for food? What's your predictions? What can we expect in a, you know? Yeah, that's so interesting because yes. there's so much food now, which is, I mean, we just, it's a, it's a tsunami of different food styles mm. now. You know, one minute it's, it's Italian, then it's all of a sudden, all ingredient wise particularly, you know, it's kale and then quinoa mm. and your head's spinning. Mm. And then natural grains and then Pete Evans and his paleo and all that sort of stuff. Uh, 
and we've got the American barbecue wave now happening with smoked meats and briskets mm -hmm. in the Texas style and all that sort of stuff. Then there's the Korean thing, well, which, is, yeah. you know, which is big at the moment as well, lots of deep yes. fried Korean chicken. Um, the future, do you know what Australia's really good at is distilling other people's food. I mean, no one does Asian in the world like Australian chefs. Yeah, okay. No mm -hmm. um, David Thompson from Long Chim, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know of David. Just, just distilling yeah. the essence of what makes, so great Southeast Asian food is all about big flavours, lemongrass, mm. kaffir lime, all those marvellous flavours, the sourness and the saltiness of a good fish sauce and all those mm. sorts. Of, but distilling it into a kind of a Western context, so it's just banging with flavour. And you're also an owner of your own restaurant? I am. Young George in East Fremantle. Yes. Which is a um, fantastic little restaurant. We've got a, a restaurant, we've got a bar, big cellar downstairs, and also a liquor store, which is all in the same heritage building. And I assume you can't, are you doing your own review? <laughs> I wish I could review my own <laughs> restaurant, but no, I can't. <laughs> if you could, give us a If game. I could, I would. I'd 20 out of 20, obviously. Beautiful. Yeah. Hello, darling, we'll come and do the Hello, darling review. Eh? Yes. It goes from one to five lips. How many lips can you take? Five lips is the top. Five lips is the top rating. What would you give? Oh, well, you haven't tried. I have to go. Yeah, you I'm waiting for the invitation. You'll yeah. okay. give it six. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for preparing a surprise dish for our Hello Darling viewers today. What's on the menu today? Well, I thought we're in the Ferguson Kitchen showroom, or the, the outdoor al fresco -y thing they do here with some amazing barbecues. So I thought we'd do Polo alla griglia. Great Italian dish. Very simple. Chicken roasted on a pan. But I've got an interesting thing. I use a brick. Wow. A house brick. At home. No, no, with the Here. chicken. So you put the brick on top of this beautiful barbecue. I'll show you more. Okay. And what are we drinking today? Well, Bloody Mary, it's the champion's breakfast and um, I think we should get stuck in it. We'll have one of those as well. It's bloody time for Bloody Mary. Bloody oath. All right, let's time go. Time for Hello Darling review. Okay, wow. so here we are. I'm looking forward. In the kitchen. I can smell already. Yes, I know, there's lots of garlic. So. Rob, tell our viewers what's on the menu today. So we're going to do a very simple dish, but it takes a bit of technique, and that's polo alla griglia, which is essentially chicken on a, on a char grill. Yes. So it gets lots of smoky flavours. It's full of garlic, full of great... Um, it's been marinating for about, oh, I don't know now, probably about 24 hours, and uh, it's ready to roll. Wow. Rob. Yes. Okay. Ah, and what are we drinking? Oh, today it's Bloody Mary, of course, the breakfast of champions. Yes. Love a Bloody Mary, good vodka, some Tabasco, lovely yes. tomato sauce. Oh, Tomato juice, rather, and because you can't see, it's like camouflage <laughs> as well. Okay. Can anyone well, see me here? <laughs> in your case, mm. cheers. Mm. Delicious. Get your heart started, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Okay. So, Barbara, this has been marinating for a long time. Now, the marinade itself, which is fresh herbs essentially, we've got fresh thyme, fresh um, uh, rosemary, we've got lemon zest in there, and everything. Now, you don't want to put this on the grill because it'll just flare up. So, ah. get all that off as much as you can. And then the secret to doing this properly, is pat it dry, because if that oil drips through, the whole thing just bursts into flame, yes. and it's not a lot of fun. So you pat it away, so all the oil's out of there, mm -hmm. much as you can. If you leave a little bit on, that's fine. Mm -hmm. A final seasoning of salt, although it's been sitting in a salt, mm -hmm. make sure that you get a nice bit of salt on there so it'll crust up. Mm -hmm. Now, there you go. Put it, put it meat side down first. Yes. That's Always the, this way first. That's the sound you love, isn't mm -hmm. it? And that then, the reason we do that is it then gives us time while it's starting to cook to get rid of excess oil and stuff off the top. Also, you want to salt that as well, mm -hmm. so you get a nice crust on it. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, the secret, Barbara. Mm -hmm. You've got to modulate your heat. This is a thick bit of meat, right? Yeah. And if you take it out of the fridge, it's, it's, it's a problem for you. So, we... Just modulate your heat. You've got to cook it on a low heat, otherwise it'll be charred on the outside and raw on the middle. Yeah. It'll take a good half hour, mm -hmm. all right, at least. Now modulate your I'm going to turn the heat back up now to get the smoking away, mm -hmm. get lots of that lovely smoky flavour happening, um, and we just let it do its thing. Mm -hmm. We'll turn it over, and then my secret weapon will come into play. Do you know what my secret weapon is? Not here, darling. A house brick. So we wrap it in alfoil to make it nice and hygienic. Yes. But essentially, when we turn it over onto the skin side, we're going to put the house brick on top. Yes. And that ensures that all that skin has beautiful contact with these bars and you get a lovely, crunchy, crispy skin. Incredible. I know. I thought it was a loaf of bread waiting for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So there we go. So we just wait now while it does its magic and it's already starting to smoke. And um, 
We'll come back in a little second and turn it over and start the other side as well. Great. So when do you know when to turn it? I mean, you do know, but how do I know? Well, it's a bit suck and see, really. You've just yes. got to, the thing is, you don't want to burn it. So yeah. we'll probably have to turn it back again. But for the time being, we'll just get it going on this side. See wow. those lovely colours there? Beautiful, so yes. So we've now got the skin side down, but we want that skin to make contact. Here's our house brick. Mm -hmm. And this puts a lot of weight on it. Ah. See that? Now, what will happen as a consequence of that, you get a lovely, crunchy thing on the bottom. It actually assists in it cooking as well because it flattens the bird out so it cooks more evenly right across it. Incredible. So we'll let the brick do its magic, shall we? i never seen brick being that useful, <laughs> darling, in a, uh, in a kitchen yet. Exactly. So, Barbara. So, darling, kiss. Yes. yes, now, I reckon that's going to be crisp and golden and delicious on that side. Wow. Really? Oh, hey? he's ready, darling. Eh? So, no, not ready yet. So we've not got ready more yet. on the other side now to really cook it through. Yes. But that's a good, that's maybe 10 minutes away. How can you test if the chicken is not ready to avoid the bloody Couple of things. mistake? You can move this bit here. This mm -hmm. is the leg. Mm -hmm. And if it moves freely, in other words, the tendons are cooked, mm -hmm. right, then it's fine. So if it does that, that's still got a bit of resistance in it. You mm -hmm. can feel it there. So deep down in there is where the hardest bit to cook. Once that starts moving freely, job done. Okay. Once it falls off, it's really cooked. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Wow, it looks perfect. Is perfect. it ready? It is ready. Can you smell it too? All the time. That huh? marinating's really done the job. Beautiful and charred on the bottom yes. side. Yes. Beautiful here. You, fit, you hear that? There's a bit of moisture still left in it. Yes. Knives are out. Now for the test. Time for Hello so. Darling review. So this is, now you can see here. The breast is beautifully cooked. See that? All yes, the way through. beautiful. Really moist. Beautiful. Would you like a taste? I love a taste. I can't wait. Take the whole thing off. And there you go. Now this is going to be, I'll just rip it off the bone. That's all right with you. Excuse me for that. This will be the best chicken. There you go, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Right, shall we? Shall we? Bon appétit. Bon appétit. Many Hello, darling. Got. Creating. Mm. Five lips. Five out of five. <laughs> it's That's before the skin. It's, it's beautiful. Moist, isn't it? Very moist. Very tender. And well, there you very, go. very tasty in terms of. We didn't even put salt or pepper, and no. the taste are here. Exactly. See that? Just sweet as. Perfect. Perfect. Cheers. Oh, I forgot the drink. Actually, six out of five. Six out of five. Thank you. What a win. Thank you, Rob, for being on Hello Darling. You're going to obviously give the recipe to our viewers. I will. Nobody will do it like you, but we will try. <laughs> Thank you, Rob.